It's a great honor to be with President Kagame. And we have uh, had tremendous uh, discussions on Rwanda. The job they've done is uh, absolutely terrific. We have trade with Rwanda. Uh, and just general, I would say, great relationships. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Mr. President, uh, as being the new head of the African Union. That's a great honor. This was just announced recently, and uh, that really truly is a great honor. So please give my regards. I know you're going to your first meeting very shortly. And please give my warmest regards. But it's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, it was a great honor to meet uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Donald Trump. And uh, we had good discussions uh, on those two levels. Uh, the, bilateral relations uh, between Rwanda and the United States. Rwanda has benefited tremendously uh, from the support of the United <coughs> States in many areas where it is in peace support operations we have carried out in different parts of the world. We had the United States on our side supporting us. They have supported our economy in trade, investment. We see a lot of uh, uh, Tourists from the United States, visitors sure. coming to Rwanda, and uh, President, I wanted to thank you for uh, the support you have received from you personally and the administration. And uh, we are looking forward to also working with the United States at the level of the African Union, where we are carrying out reforms at the African Union so that we get our act together to do the right things. and. That helps in cooperating with the United States. Uh, it would be more beneficial when we are organized to know what we want from the United States sure. for that cooperation. So I thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have all of you here. And uh, we'll speak for a little bit longer. And thank you very much. Thank you. For this is the sixth of our hustings on our national tour. And we're at the halfway point. And we've been so far to Leeds, Exeter, Cardiff, Eastbourne, and Darlington. And for me, it's good to be home in the southwest where I live. And I actually get to, get to go home this weekend. It's so good to see so many southwest friends here tonight. And friends from around the country as well, particularly the southeast and the West Midlands. Welcome to the best region in the country. Thank you to you all for attending this evening, because these hustings offer us, the members of the Conservative Party, to take part in a great exercise of democracy where we get to choose our new leader. She or he will be announced on the 5th of September, and as we're the party of government, then we become Prime Minister very soon afterwards. As Ian Dale, who moderated many of these hustings in 2019, said, and I quote, I found chairing the hustings a surprisingly positive experience. The members really put the two candidates through their paces and asked some very searching questions. So I ask you tonight to make your questions searching, to make them succinct, and to ask questions and not make statements. One question each, please so that more of the audience have an opportunity to grill our candidates. Both of our candidates have a duty and a desire to fulfill our 2019 manifesto. Their differences will be about how to go about that and achieving it in a very different world from 2019. Post-Brexit, post-COVID, in uncertain times internationally, look at the Ukraine and Taiwan and where our very union as a nation is being challenged. So I'm sure tonight that you'll want to test our candidates, to seek to establish their strengths, and to see who you think is best capable of running our great nation. As we're all conservatives here, well, I hope, because we did have some hecklers in Eastbourne, I know that you'll be respectful of our two candidates and keep your questions positive. As you know, our ballot has opened. You can cast your vote online or by post. It's very easy to vote online, or you can choose traditional snail mail. And if you do vote by post, 
then please remember to put a stamp on your envelope. You should have received your ballot paper by today, and if you haven't, then please contact your constituency chairman or constituency office, who will be able to help you. My hope is that this evening will give you more clarity about how to cast your ballot. I hope that you'll go away enthused and energised in your commitment to helping our great party to win the next election. We need your help and support. Finally, because we're in the Southwest, I want to thank our regional chairman, Julian Ellicott, for all that you do. Julian, it's much appreciated. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's get on with the show. Please welcome Chairman of the Conservative Party, Andrew Stevenson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to our sixth of the nationwide hustings that we're holding across the country. I'm delighted to be joined by so many party members tonight at what is another sellout event, an event that gives you, our members, the chance to put your questions directly to the candidates. All of these events are available online too, so welcome to all of you joining us virtually this evening. Since becoming chairman, I've been getting out and about across the country, including visiting seats and campaigning here in the Southwest. Campaigning with conservative activists in Truro and Falmouth, St. Ives, and today in Cheltenham. Seats in this region are key to our success at the next general election. So it's been great to campaign alongside so many dedicated party members. We've had an incredibly strong slate of candidates for this leadership election. Together, the most diverse range of candidates for any leadership election in British history. Labour would love a female leader, but we could be about to have our third female Prime Minister before they've had one. Or our first Prime Minister of Asian heritage, the second Conservative Prime Minister from an ethnic minority background after Benjamin Disraeli. I'm staying neutral in this contest, as are all of our hard-working party staff. But I do believe we have two fantastic candidates. Either of them can tackle the big issues our country is facing, taking us forward together. We are the world's most successful political party. And that is down to our ideas, down to the support of our members and our record. Our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has shown that a Conservative government can rise to the challenges of today. Getting Brexit done, delivering the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, protecting over 14 million jobs during the pandemic, and leading the world in supporting Ukraine and standing up to Putin. That is a truly historic record, which our next leader will build upon with the support of party members. Before we hear from each of our two candidates, let us just remember why a strong Conservative government is so important. The alternative is a Labour-led government, likely in coalition with the Liberal Democrats and the SNP, which would risk the integrity of our United Kingdom. Labour would have never broken the Brexit deadlock. They voted against tax cuts for low-income families. They voted against additional investment in our NHS and they voted against protecting our borders and tackling the vile people smugglers. And now they want Sir Keir Starmer to run our country when he can't even get his own party on side with a hard-working majority of British people against Labour's union paymasters. With shadow ministers even joining picket lines, it's very clear that Labour still isn't working. Remember when Labour last left government, they admitted there was no money left and no Labour government has ever left office with unemployment lower than when they came to power. That is what is at stake. It is our next leader who will relentlessly continue to deliver for the British people, leading the way in standing up for our ideals and our partners on the world stage, uniting the country and uniting our Conservative Party. I know that you all want to hear from the two candidates to help you decide who to choose to lead our great party and our country. So with no further ado, 
Let me hand over to your host here in Cheltenham this evening, Camilla Tomney. Thank you very much. Wow, it feels a bit like being in a boxing ring, this, doesn't it? It's lucky they're not going head-to-head. -head. I'd have to be a referee, I think, with all the briefing that's been going on. Welcome to Cheltenham. I'm sorry if you had a trouble getting in. Um, if anyone is currently glued to an Extinction Rebellion protester, let us know. We'll have some extra numbers in. But would you believe this is actually going to be the biggest hustings that have been hosted so far in this contest? I think there's 2,000 people here. So thank you very much for making the effort. Now, obviously, we're in a race course, so I feel I have to use a few racing analogies. We're not in the final furlong, are we? We're kind of halfway through. There's sort of still a steep climb and then a kind of free will to the finish. And I know the bookmakers are saying that this is a one-horse race. They're saying that Liz Truss, I think, is ahead by two to one members. Maybe some of you in here are going to be disagreeing with that. We've had Rishi Sunak, haven't we, slightly on his high horse saying that he'd rather lose than compromise on his own principles. So again, we're going to challenge him on that. But generally, this is all about you deciding, if you are currently undecided, who should be in the winner's enclosure. So I'm going to invite you to ask as punchy a questions as you can, as succinctly as you can. If we can try and avoid any repetition, that would be good. And it would also be good to hear from undecideds. I know a lot of you have got the kind of Liz for leader, ready for Rishi t-shirts on. But do put your hand up if you are genuinely undecided and there's some burning issue that you want to ask, because obviously that's what this evening is all about. Um, and how it's going to work is like this. Um, if you haven't been to a hustings before, both candidates come on and they'd address you independently for 10 minutes. So I believe Liz is going to come on first, do a 10-minute speech. Then Rishi's going to come on and do his 10-minute speech. And then I'm going to invite Liz back on the stage, have a chat with her for about 12 to 15 minutes, and open the floor to questions, and then repeat the process with Rishi Sunak. So everyone's clear how this works. Um, well, let's get this show on the road, I think is all that's left to say. Please welcome Brandon Lewis. Good evening. It's fantastic to be here in Cheltenham, and I'm here to introduce Liz Truss for you this evening. I first got to know Liz when we were candidates together ahead of the 2010 general election, both of us Norfolk candidates. And what I saw, even back then with Liz, was somebody who understood what it took to win, what she needed to do to fight for and to deliver for her constituents, both in her own seat and across Norfolk, where she helped Chloe Smith in the by-election, as well as up in Newark as well, and she came to Great Yarmouth in 2010 and 15 to do her bit for her colleagues, to make sure that we returned a Conservative government, because she knew what we needed to do, the work we all needed to put in, to make sure we had a Conservative government for our country. In 2010, we then became MPs together, and I've seen her consistently fight, not just for her constituents, but working together collegiately to deliver for people across Norfolk. In 2012, Liz and I both became ministers at the same time. And again, what I've seen consistently in her time in government, across a number of government departments, is somebody whose focus has been on delivering, getting things done for the people across the United Kingdom and across a range of departments. Whether it's delivering in the Department of Trade on the phenomenal trade deals that she did as we've come out of the European Union, or whether it's challenging orthodoxies where they need to be challenged to do things better and differently, to deliver better for people across our country, Liz has consistently delivered. And most recently, we've seen her as Foreign Secretary. And as Northern Ireland Secretary, I stood side by side with Liz and saw how she stood up for the people of the United Kingdom, stood up strongly for the people of Northern Ireland against the European Union. And it's because of Liz Truss that we have the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill to deal with the issues that have been left in the Northern Ireland Protocol for us to deal with. She dealt with that. It's complicated. It's controversial. It's difficult. But Liz was determined to do the right thing and give the difficult message to the EU that we are going to stand up, and she has stood up for the people of the United Kingdom. 
She has done that in difficult times, as we've seen, standing up to Putin and being clear with Russia about the abhorrence of their invasion of Ukraine, and stood side by side with our Prime Minister and our Defence Secretary for the people of Ukraine. And even this week, we've seen her standing up and strong against the pressures we are seeing and the challenges we are seeing with China. Liz consistently stands up for the UK. She understands the union of the United Kingdom. And as the next, hopefully, from my point of view, leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party, that's what I want to see. As somebody who will do that job as a Conservative, delivering on those core principles that we as a party stand for, freedom of speech, the ability to have a low tax, high growth, really fast-moving economy in this country, Liz can deliver that. She wants to deliver that for the whole of the United Kingdom. And those are the reasons, and her determination and her track record of getting things done are the reasons why I am backing Liz Truss to be our next leader and the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's fantastic to be here in Cheltenham. Now, in 1996, at the age of 21, I joined the Conservative Party. But I have a dark secret that I want to share with you tonight. Before that, I was a member of the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> Look, I know I have sinned, but it was a teenage mistake. And all I can say is in my time in the Liberal Democrats, I learned all of their dark secrets and dirty tricks. I learned about the bar charts with the fake numbers in them. I learned about them telling one thing to one group of people and one thing to another group of people. And I learned that they didn't share my principles, a belief in low taxation and freedom and the, people, the ability of people to shape their own lives. And what I can tell you is if you select me as your Prime Minister, I will make sure the Liberal Democrats never come back here again in Cheltenham or anywhere else in the West of England. And I will re-establish, I will re-establish the Liberal Democrat unit at CCHQ to make sure we have a crack force stopping that happening. Now, I'm not from a traditional Conservative background. I grew up in Paisley in Scotland and Leeds in Yorkshire, where I went to a comprehensive school. And at my school, what I saw is I saw children being let down. Let down by low expectations because of their background. Let down by the left-wing Leeds City Council, who preferred political correctness to making sure that all children understood English and maths. And let down by lack of opportunity in the area. And that's what made me want to go into politics, because I thought it was a huge waste. And I wanted something different for everybody in our country. I want everybody from all areas to have the opportunity to succeed. I want us to be an aspiration nation. But the fact is, we do face very difficult economic times. We have the aftermath of COVID. We have the war being perpetrated by Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. And we have an energy crisis. And this comes after two decades of relatively low growth here in Britain. And my friends, I do not think we can carry on with business as usual. We need to do things differently. We need a bold plan for growth. And that is what I would deliver as your Prime Minister. First of all, I'd unleash the full potential of Brexit, getting all of the EU laws off our statute books by the end of 2023. <laughs> Doing you know, whether it's our procurement rules, whether it's unleashing the tens of billions of investment that we can when we get rid of the EU investment rules, which will turbocharge industries like aerospace, which are so important for this region, I will get that done. And what I'll also do is I will lower taxes. First of all, I will reverse the increase in national insurance. We should never have done it. It was against our manifesto commitment we can still afford to pay for the NHS and social care out of general taxation and be able to pay down our debt starting within three years. 
I'd also have a temporary moratorium on the green energy levy so that people can immediately save money on their fuel bills. And what I'd also do is keep corporation tax low because under current plans, we are planning to raise corporation tax to the same level as France and 10 points higher to Ireland. And I don't think that is a good way to get our economy going and to be attracting investment into our country. So I would keep corporation tax low because fundamentally, I'm a conservative. I believe that people should keep more of their own money and that we should back people who do the right thing, whether they're business owners, the self-employed, people who go into work every day. I will legislate to make sure there are essential services provided on our railways and they can't be disrupted by militant trade unions. Now, after I became a member of the Conservative Party, I was a local councillor. And one of my jobs as local councillor was sitting on the planning committee. And I'm afraid those are hours of my life that I will never get back. <laughs> because every decision we tried to make, we were told we couldn't do it because of the planning inspectorate in Bristol or because of the top-down targets from Whitehall. So what I would do is legislate in the levelling up bill to remove those top-down targets and to give local communities decision-making over house building. And what I would also do, what I would also do is make sure we're levelling up in a conservative way. And that includes rural areas who've lost out on broadband, lost out on mobile phone signal, lost out on roads. I would make sure we're funding our rural areas fairly. I also would back our fantastic farmers. And I think one of the most depressing sights when you're driving through England is seeing fields that should be full of crops or livestock full of solar panels. I will, <laughs> I will change the rules to make sure that farmers don't have to fill in so many forms, but actually can focus their efforts on producing food. And that's really important at a time we're facing massive global food insecurity issues. And in order to deal with that, we need to continue to stand up to Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. I'm proud that we were the first country to send weapons to Ukraine in Europe to help them in their struggle for freedom and democracy. And very near here is GCHQ, which came up with a lot of the intelligence that we used to expose Vladimir Putin's appalling plans. I, as Foreign Secretary, put the toughest sanctions regime on Russia of any country in the world. But we cannot be complacent about our defence and our security. What we need to do is make sure we're investing in defence because we face an increasing threat. That's why I would put defence funding up to 3% of GDP. I'll also make sure we tackle the small boats in the English Channel. I supported Priti Patel and the Rwanda scheme. And I want to extend that scheme to more countries. And I will also make sure that British legislators cannot be overruled by the ECHR. I will legislate for that. I will legislate for that in the British Bill of Rights. I'm determined that we should stand up for freedom and democracy around the world. But I'm also determined that we should stand up for it here in Britain. Now, I'm a plain talking Yorkshire woman, and I know that a woman is a woman. And I will challenge identity politics. I will stand up for single sex spaces like domestic violence shelters. And I will make sure that our culture in public services and in the civil service reflects the views of the vast majority of people in Britain. And I'll also challenge those who try and talk our country down 
who say our best days are behind us, that somehow we should be ashamed of our history, that somehow we should be kowtowing uh, to other countries around the world. Quite the opposite is true. I travel the world and I know that people have huge respect for the United Kingdom and what we offer. What we need is a bit more respect for ourselves and our values. And we need to make sure, we need to make sure that we don't allow the doom mongers to talk us into a neg negative cycle. I'm somebody who, as Prime Minister, will deliver for the whole United Kingdom. I've shown that in the jobs I've done, whether it's the dozens of trade deals at the Department of Trade that people said wouldn't be possible, whether it's the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which got a lot of resistance in Whitehall, but was the right thing to do to make sure that we protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And I'm not somebody who takes no for an answer. I keep pushing and I keep pushing until I get things done. And I think that's what the people of Britain want to see. We had a great manifesto in 2019. We promised all kinds of fantastic things, but we need to deliver the doctors and nurses. We need to deliver on our promises on immigration. We need to deliver on our promises on the economy. We need to deliver on unleashing opportunity right across this country, rural areas, urban areas, north, south, east, west. We need to deliver on all that. And I am the person that can do that. And I will be able to beat the declinist Keir Starmer, who is yet another North London Labour leader, who simply doesn't understand the British people are aspirational, that they want better for their future and they want better for our country. And I will be able to defeat the Liberal Democrats because we will have a positive vision for our rural areas. We will have a positive vision for unleashing opportunity right across Britain. And we will be able to win the general election in 2024 and deliver right across our great nation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's Liz Truss's pitch. We're going to hear from Rishi Sunak in just a moment. There's just a few technological, I don't know, things that need to go on in the background. So I'm just going to fill in for a minute by saying, don't forget that we're covering all of this on The Telegraph. I have to give The Telegraph a plug, not least because my editor is standing right in front of me. Um, there's probably thousands of people now watching this on the live stream and equally on our YouTube channel. So you can access all of the hustings because we've got them on the Telegraph website, even if you can't physically be there. And without further ado, I think we're now ready to introduce Rishi Sunak. Please welcome Alex Chalk. I'm actually, sorry guys, I'm actually not Rishi Sunak, uh, um, but, but do you know what? I'm very pleased though that um, to be saying I'm Al I am Alex Chalk because it wasn't that long ago that I knocked on a door in Cheltenham and the door opened and this lady goes, oh I know who you are. You might be better than your brother, but we don't want David Miliband here either, she said. <laughs> And that, unfortunately, is a completely true story. Now, um, I am delighted to be here, to be welcoming you here to Cheltenham and to be introducing Rishi Sunak and to be giving him my 100% support. And in backing him, I'm not just one of six, uh, of, of five of the six Gloucestershire MPs who know him and have worked alongside him for many years, people who have fought Liberals and Labour, I also stand with great Conservative thinkers who have come to Cheltenham to speak at the Literature Festival. Think William Haig. Think Daniel Finkelstein, to name but two, but also conservative titans, titans of our party. Nigel Lawson, Norman Lamont, Peter Lilly, Michael Howard. Now we all see in Rishi, as William Hague so powerfully said, a rare find in British politics. A man of exceptional ability, intellect and emotional intelligence. A man who, by the way, had the gumption to deliver a furlough scheme that the IMF said was the best in the world. And, and critically, he is a man with judgment. 
because judgment is going to be absolutely essential in the coming months. Because when it comes to inflation, Rishi gets just how important it is to defeat it because the truth is, in terms of headwinds on our economy, inflation is a hurricane. And three, just marvel at this, three of the 18 wards that I represent in Cheltenham are in the bottom decile of income per capita anywhere in our country. There are areas of great deprivation in Gloucestershire and Rishi understands that inflation can be absolutely devastating. Because to see where it can lead us, you don't need a crystal ball, you can read the book. History shows us that inflation does generational damage, it can devastate household incomes, it makes getting on top of government spending far more difficult, it puts downward pressure on the pound. It's why Thatcher called it, Margaret Thatcher called it the biggest destroyer of all. But I've seen in Rishi someone who wants to deliver prosperity and financial stability, not just for the sake of it, but for what it can do for our country, for the British people, for my constituents. He knows that it's stability that will catalyze our economy and deliver the jobs, prosperity, and excellent public services that flow from it. And also, it helps us find what Churchill called the treasure in the heart of every man. And it was on the back of a stable economy that this government, with Rishi as chancellor, delivered in my constituency alone 30 million pounds for a new school, 40 million pounds for a brand new hospital wing which is going up as we speak, 23 million pounds to lay the groundwork for a cyber park to the west of GCHQ, 3 million pounds for an advanced digital academy in one of Cheltenham's most deprived wards, 6 million pounds for state-of-the-art diagnostic scanners. All these things have changed lives here in Gloucestershire and will do in the future because if we secure our economy, all this we can do and more. We can deliver opportunities for our young people and we can keep vital national security organizations like GCHQ properly resourced. And I tell you now, as somebody who spends a lot of time speaking to my constituents out and about in my infamous and frankly repellent high-vis jacket, <laughs> there is a candidate who speaks not just to the party, but to the country. A candidate who I hear, who I hear on the streets time and again, as recently as three hours ago, who can reach floating voters and who can save our country from the misery of a Labour, Lib Dem, SNP stitch-up which would literally tear our country apart. A candidate who can put us in the best position to win the marginal seats in Gloucestershire like Cheltenham and Stroud. A candidate who can lead this country to a great future. That candidate, ladies and gentlemen, that Prime Minister, is Rishi Sunak. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the warm welcome introduction. It is fantastic to be with you all tonight. Thank you for having me. Now, look, so I've been out and about campaigning, and there's one thing I realise. People always ask me about my relationship with the Prime Minister. As you might imagine, there's been a topic of conversation in this leadership contest, but not always in the way that you might expect. Just the other day, this lady came to me and she said, you know, you and Boris are very different, aren't you? I thought, yes, let's see where this is going to go. She said, she said, he looks like he's lost his hairbrush, but you look like your mum's brushed your hair. So, in any case, right, I am standing here in front of you tonight, in front of this extraordinary conservative crowd, for one very simple reason. And that's because our country did something extraordinary for my family it welcomed them here as immigrants 60 years ago and allowed them to build a better life. Now, I was raised with a few simple values. First is that family means everything to me because the bonds of family are far greater than anything any government could ever hope to replicate and we as conservatives must never ever forget that. Now, in my family, there was one thing that we prioritised above all as the way to forge ahead, and that was hard work. My dad was an NHS GP, my mum ran the local chemist in Southampton where I grew up, and I spent all my time working in her shop, out and about in the community, delivering medicines to people, but also doing her books, her accounts, seeing the power of that small business to provide jobs and opportunity in our local community. Now, for my parents, there was one thing that they believed, above all else, would be the path 
to making sure that their three children had the better future that they dreamed of. And that was simple. And it was education. And that's why today I passionately believe, <laughs> like all of you, I passionately believe that the best way that we reduce inequality in society, the best way that we spread opportunity, indeed, the best way that we transform people's lives is to ensure that the birthright of every child is a world-class education. So that, so that, in a nutshell, are my values. Patriotism, family, hard work, service, aspiration. And I know, as I look at all of you, that those are your values too. And that's because they're conservative values. And that's why I want to be your leader and PM, to put those values into action to build a better Britain. And just as our country allowed my family the ability to provide that for me. I want to do the same for everyone, for your children and grandchildren, and make sure they have those same amazing opportunities too. But, but how, how will we do that? Well, we need to do three things. Firstly, we need to restore trust. Next, we need to rebuild the economy. And then we need to reunite our country. Now restoring trust for me starts with honesty and as you can see in this leadership race I haven't always said the things that people may want to hear but I've said the things that people need to hear because our country faces real challenges. <laughs> and I want to be straight with you and everyone else about what is going to be required to fix those. But even though that doesn't make my life easy, it is honest and for me, that's what leadership is all about. But we'll also restore trust by delivering on the things that matter to people. And that's why I've set out a plan to start reforming the NHS so that we can focus less on how much money we're always putting into it and more on the faster, better healthcare that we want to get out of it. It's It's why I want to make sure that we restore trust with our rural communities. I represent a seat up in North Yorkshire and I want to make sure that a government that I lead backs food security, gets the trade deals right and supports British farming. <laughs> and we need to spread opportunity everywhere, which is why as Chancellor I made sure that we funded rural broadband just round the corner. It's why. I funded the duelling of the A417 at the Air Balloon Roundabout. Because levelling up, levelling up is not just about the North, it's for everywhere, including right here. But it's also why, it's also why I've set out a radical plan to finally tackle illegal migration. Because for too long, all of us have watched on our TV screens people coming here illegally in boats, and it is wrong, and it must stop. Now, we are a proud, compassionate country that will always welcome those who need our help, welcome people like my family, but they must come here legally and properly. <laughs> now, when it comes to rebuilding the economy, I don't need to tell all of you, you know what the number one challenge is. It is inflation. And we've seen this story before. Inflation is the enemy that makes everyone poorer. It eats into people's hard-earned savings, their pensions. It pushes up mortgage rates. And I will always support those who most need our help. And this autumn and winter, a Conservative government that I am privileged to lead will be proud not just to cut VAT on energy bills, but to go further to support the most vulnerable in our society, because that's what a compassionate Conservative governments do. But what I will not do, what I will not do is pursue policies that risk making inflation far worse and last far longer, especially if those policies seem to amount to borrowing £50 billion and putting it on the country's credit card and asking our kids and our grandkids to pick up the tab. 
because that's not right. It's not responsible and it is certainly not conservative. But we will cut taxes. And for the first time in 16 years in this parliament, I will cut income tax. Because as a conservative, I want to make sure that hard work always pays. And I won't stop there. Just like Nigel Lawson, we will go on cutting income tax for years to come, but we will do that responsibly. We will do it by being tough and efficient with public spending, and we will do it by growing our economy. And that's why this autumn, I will radically change how we tax businesses in this country to reward and incentivize those businesses that are doing the right thing by investing in expanding their businesses, the businesses that are investing in R&D and innovation to create the products and services of the future. Because in a modern economy, that's how you drive growth. And you know it, it's happening right here with fusion technology, with the cyber campus. That's the kind of economy we need to build and my tax reforms will ensure that we deliver it everywhere. But we'll also do it. We'll also do it by taking advantage of Brexit. Now, it does puzzle me because I keep reading that somehow I'm not Brexity enough in this leadership race. I, it, it does puzzle me because I, I do think I was the one that actually voted and campaigned for Brexit in the first place. I radically set up new free ports across the country, an idea that I came up with that right now are attracting jobs and investment to places that desperately need it. It's why, as Chancellor, I also set out radical reforms of all our financial services regulations, scrapping the EU laws, replacing them with new British ones to make sure that this is the most dynamic economy in the world. That's what I know how to do. My business experience means I can lead our economy into the future and seize those opportunities that are there waiting for us if we are prepared to be bold and ambitious about grabbing them. Yeah. Because in two years' time, we have to do something very special. When it comes to reuniting our country, we have to do something that has never, ever been done before. We have to make British political history by winning a fifth general election in a row. But I believe, even though it hasn't been done, working together, all of us, with Alex in his high-vis jacket, we can indeed do it. But, as you know, as you know right here in Gloucestershire, it means that we have to appeal to swing voters everywhere, in urban areas and rural areas, in Brexit areas and Remain areas, in liberal-leaning areas and Labour-leaning areas. And I passionately believe, and the evidence supports, that I am the candidate that gives our party the best opportunity not just here in Gloucestershire, but across the country in beating Labour and the Liberals and ensuring that Keir Starmer never walks through the door of 10 Downing Street. So in conclusion, in conclusion, let me just say this. You saw me as Chancellor at the beginning of the pandemic, acting boldly, radically, competently to protect millions of jobs and businesses and successfully ensure that our economy remained resilient in the face of the biggest economic shock in 300 years. Well, I promise you that as your Prime Minister, I will apply that same urgency, grip, and radicalism to every other aspect of government as we build a better Britain. A Britain where our children walk safely on the streets at night a Britain where the NHS is reformed and efficient and there for us when we need. A Britain where our schools and apprenticeships are the envy of the world in providing opportunity. And a Britain where our economy is the most dynamic it has ever been, with our businesses investing and innovating, creating jobs and prosperity in every part of our United Kingdom. But I also promise you this, perhaps more important, I promise you I will give you my all my everything, my heart and my soul every day to ensuring that each and every one of you here tonight can always feel enormously proud of the Conservative government that I will be privileged to lead. So I humbly ask for your support, not just to be our next party leader, 
but also the next Prime Minister of our great country. Thank you. Okay, so those are the pitches, but we're obviously going to delve into the detail. And with that in mind, I'd like to welcome Liz Truss back onto the stage. Come and take a seat. Hi, Camilla. Hello, Great how to are see you? you? Very well. Come and sit down. Right, uh, let's get into the most burning issue of the day, the week, the month, the time and the summer. We've had financial journalist Martin Lewis warn today that the cost of living crisis is going to be as serious and detrimental to people as the pandemic. We've got the Telegraph website warning that energy bills might hit £5,000 in January. And we've also got Google Trends data showing that there has been a 2,400% increase in people Googling the term, can't pay my bills. So what exactly are you going to do to bring energy bills down, not in the future, but immediately if you become Prime Minister? Well, first of all, what we shouldn't be doing is taking money off people in taxes and then giving it back to them in benefits. So the first thing we should be doing is lowering taxes. But how do we so, so, and on day one, on day one, what I would do is reverse the national insurance increase, but also have a temporary moratorium on the green energy levy, so people are saving money on their fuel bills. But how and then, second, I'm, I'm just the second thing I would do is focus on energy supply because this is an energy supply problem, and we need to deal with the root cause. We need to make sure we're using our reserves in the North Sea and incentivizing companies to do that. We need to make sure we're fracking in parts of the country where there is local support for that taking place. And we need to get on. We need to get on with delivering the small modular nuclear reactors, which we produce here in Derbyshire. And we need to get on with nuclear power stations as well. So we need to press ahead with all of those supply issues. As Prime Minister, I would make sure I am working with the energy companies to get that supply on as quickly as possible and make sure we're dealing with the issue of high costs. Now, of course, we always need to make sure that we are helping people and supporting people, but fundamentally, the key to being able to do that is having economic growth. And we are currently forecast to have a recession. We have the highest taxes in 70 years. And if we allow a recession to happen, and I think there's a real danger of us talking ourselves into a recession at the moment, we will be in a much worse position later this year and next year. So getting economic growth going, doing those post-Brexit regulatory reforms, keeping taxes low is vitally important to be able to stabilise the economy so we are able to do all we can in these very difficult circumstances. OK, so I think people are very clear on your desire to cut taxes. Let's clarify the point you made about handouts. Are you for them or against them? Camilla, what I have always said is my first preference is always to reduce taxes. I do not like the Gordon Brown style economics where you take money off people to, in taxes and give it back in benefits. And at the moment, we're all paying taxes. We're all paying taxes on the green energy levy on our fuel bills. What I can't do, though, is I can't write the Chancellor's budget before I've even been selected as Prime Minister, and I think that would be wrong. We need to look, I think this is important, we need to look at exactly what the situation is in September. We need to look at what measures we can take, both on taxes and supply and other measures. But what I am not going to do is announce the results of that work now, because I'm not Prime Minister, I haven't yet been selected as I know, Prime but Minister. If you were, and we know but, that's but, your uh, clear what ambition. I, what I've, what what I've laid about out, handouts for people but who what are What I've laid need. out is my first, my first port of call is always reducing taxes. Because I think having a money go round where you take off money and taxes and give it back in benefits is fundamentally a bad need approach. More immediate and my help. second port of call is dealing with the supply issue. 
fundamentally the problem we face is that prices are too high. And if we keep just ha the answer to every question is raising tax, we will choke off economic growth and we will send ourselves to penury. And I think that's a massive problem. Although the IFS has warned today that because of inflation, the government is likely to lose about 40% of its spending. So how can you actually afford tax cuts? You take away the levy, and then what happens to the pay rises that have been promised to doctors and nurses, for instance? Well, actually, the treasury, care? the treasury is currently making more money because of inflation out of taxes. So there are various impacts inflation has on the economy. And inflation is projected to peak at the end of this year and is projected to come down. It's been caused by a supply shock. And I think it's very important that we keep control of public sector wages, that we don't allow a wage price spiral to take place, that we do keep control of the public finances. But the most important issue we are facing is a potential recession. And what we know is that when you raise taxes too high, you actually cut off growth and you cut off revenues. So last time we reduced corporation tax, we actually increased the revenue. So it's a false economy putting up taxes. And that it is part of the Treasury orthodoxy to believe that if you put up taxes, you'll get more money in. That isn't necessarily the case. What we often see is growth cut off, people don't want to invest, people don't think Britain is open for business. And I am somebody who is low tax, pro-growth, pro-opportunity, and I want a Britain that's open for business, I want to unleash this investment. And that is vitally important to be able to have the money to afford what we need in the public services, to be able to afford to cut taxes in future. But are you low tax and high borrowing then? Rishi Sunak just suggested that some of these tax cuts are going to cost £50 billion and it's going to be put on the credit card of, I suppose, our children and grandchildren. Is that the case? So my tax cuts, and by the way, one of them isn't a tax cut, it's not raising a tax. So I support not raising corporation tax to the same level as France. But those tax changes will cost £30 billion. That is affordable within our current budget. We'll still be able to pay debt down after three years. But I'm afraid to say the plans of raising taxes are likely to lead to a recession. And with a recession, it'll be harder to pay the debt down. So I simply don't believe the argument that raising taxes will actually bring in more revenue. I think it's a very damaging thing to do, just as we have difficulties in the global economy. And none of our fellow fellow countries in the G7 are doing this. They're actually cutting taxes at the but moment. extra bor borrowing isn't sort of conservative fiscal discipline, is it? Borrowing and borrowing and borrowing. Well, the government always borrows money. That's the reality. And in fact, we are borrowing less as a percentage of GDP than Japan, than Canada, than the United States. But with interest and, rates and, going up, it's going to be expensive to but, borrow, isn't it? But Camilla, after major events, and COVID was a one in a hundred year event, it doesn't make sense to pe try and pay all the money back straight away, raising taxes and choking off growth. That doesn't make sense. Now, after the Second World War, we didn't decide we've got to pay all the debt back immediately. We paid it back over time. And I think we're trying to pay the debt off too quickly. And I think that will be damaging. And I actually think it will be counterproductive. We already forecast a recession. We know what that will mean. It will mean less money coming into the exchequer. And fundamentally, you know, people are struggling with their bills. This is why I want to cut the green energy levy to help people with their fuel bills. I know small businesses are struggling with the cost of national insurance. Public services are struggling. You know, people who run social care operations are struggling with the cost of national insurance. So this is hobbling people just at a time when we need to get the economy growing. And I think that is very, very damaging. And frankly, it's Gordon Brown economics. Okay. We saw him carry out exactly the same policies, and we've had low growth for decades. Now, you were a Liberal Democrat Remainer. You're now a Brexiteer. Are you just someone who blows in the direction of the political wind? How can people here trust in what you're saying? Isn't it just politically expedient to suddenly back leave? Well, I, I left the Liberal Democrats when I was 20, Camilla. And I think we all, you know, we all make mistakes as teenagers that we might regret. Some people drink too much, some people take drugs, uh, other people do other dangerous things. I joined the Liberal Democrats. Yeah. But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody, look, I, I freely admit, I freely admit to being on a political journey. You know, my parents were left wing. 
My first political experience was age eight, being taken on a CND march, you know, campaigning to ban the bomb with my mum. Yeah. And over time, I learned to think for myself, and I, I thought I don't agree with that. I, I thought the Soviet Union was a, you know, a damaging, <laughs> a damaging force in the world, and actually, you know, I wanted to be on the side of freedom and democracy. And it, my political views have been shaped by a desire to see people free to live their own lives and free to get on in life. And, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, have those opportunities. And that, that's what shaped... And yet, on the subject of supporting Remain, which, which I did under David Cameron's leadership, I was pretty equivocal at the time. I, you know, you can ask David Cameron about this. You know, there were lots of discussions at the time. I wasn't sure. And I was concerned about the potential disruption. But once people voted to leave, and I saw there wasn't the disruption, and I looked at the opportunities. And I have done more than most of the cabinet to deliver the opportunities of Brexit, okay. whether it's the trade deals, okay. whether it's the Northern Ireland Protocol okay. Bill. And, but, you know, frankly, I don't think we have been fast enough at delivering things like Solvency 2. I had a round table in the city last week. They told me if we got on with getting rid of Solvency 2, it would free tens of billions of pounds that we could see invested right across Britain, you know, in places like the Red Wall, in places like, you know, here in the aerospace industry, in manufacturing industry. And the fact is, that hasn't happened because Nothing Whitehall has been done. too slow. And I'm somebody that will push through Whitehall and I will get that stuff done and I will make it okay, happen. So maybe your kind of conversion on European issues is a bit like Thatcher's. You're wearing the pussy blow bow blouses. You're trying to emulate well, I'm Mrs. T. I'm like you today. Well, I think my outfit. Do you know what? We're both we in navy blue. But what, <laughs> what is the Thatcher thing? Is that are you doing that on purpose, dressing like her, acting like her? What's all that about? I'm I'm my own person. I do think it is a thing about being a woman in politics that you always get. Well, some people are saying why not? And you know, look. Don't get me wrong. I'm a massive fan of Mrs. Thatcher, but we live in different times. I am, I am my own person, but what I notice, and I hope you're going to ask, you know, Rishi Sunak, yes. you know, is he comparing himself to Ted Heath or is he comparing himself to a male politician? Because male politicians never ever get that. They never ever get All that. Right. With that in mind, I'm going to ask you a few yes nos. Can you do yes no rather than? Well, it depends uh, what the question. All right. Is. <laughs> Will you cut foreign aid? I'll keep it as it is. Will we leave the ECHR? If we need to, but I'd rather legislate through the British Bill of Rights. Will you sack 91,000 civil servants? I will certainly reduce the size of the civil service over time. This isn't yes, no, but OK. <laughs> will you scrap the BBC licence fee? I will reform the BBC licence fee, and I certainly think it's completely wrong that so many women are in jail for non-payment of it. End the net zero pledge? I will keep the net zero pledge. Pass a law enforcing neutrality in our key institutions, including schools and universities. I don't think that a law will actually change the culture. I think the culture needs to be driven from the top. And I think as conservatives, we have to be prepared to make the arguments for what we believe in. Too often we have kowtowed to left-wing ideas like identity politics. And I'm somebody who goes out and makes the argument I've been making the argument about single sex spaces. I made the argument that a woman is a woman. And that's what we need. We need strong conservatives being proud of who we are, making those arguments. You can't pass a law to tell people what to think. No. What you have to do is you make an argument. And there will always be left wing people. You know, socialism never dies. Even though it's never worked in any country in the world, we still had Jeremy Corbyn yeah. and his movement. So, you know, what we, what we have to be prepared to do is make the argument and be bold. And, you know, and this is my point about taxes. You know, how on earth can we as conservatives have the highest tax rates for 70 years and say that they should go up? I just find that absolutely astonishing. We have to have the courage of our convictions, which is believing that people should be able to spend their own money and it's their money. Yep. Believing in business, being prepared to back business, big and small, and being prepared to be on the side who, who work hard, who are enterprising. You know, 
and frankly, we, we've conceded in too many of those debates. Last and there's too year. much, you know, one thing I absolutely don't support is a windfall tax. I think it's a labor idea. It's all about bashing business, and it sends the wrong message to international investors and to the public. But then what do the public think about energy giants making three billion pounds in profits, while, by the way, they're already three billion pounds in debt to them? Well, first of all, I don't think profit is a dirty word. And the fact it's become a dirty word in our society is a massive problem. Because there are, you know, in this audience today, we have hundreds of people who run businesses and make a profit, and I think that's a good thing. Now, of course, the energy giants, if they're in an oligopoly, should be held to account. And I would make sure they're rigorously held to account. But the way we bandy the word around profit is it, is it something that's dirty and evil. We shouldn't be doing that as conservatives. And no, actually, we're playing into the hands of people like Jeremy Corbyn, who want to completely undermine our way of life. We must go to the audience. Final yes or no, cap on immigration? No. no. I think we should, we should have the skills we need in our country, but I don't believe in an arbitrary target. And when we had one before, it didn't work. All right. Audience, um, you can see people with microphones. They're wearing white. Put your hand up. As I said before, it'd be great to get some undecideds rather than someone in a T-shirt because we kind of already know where you stand on these issues. Um, this man here. I, I believe that these people can be converted, Camilla. Well, all right. See if you can convert a, uh, a ready for Rishia. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm a, an undecided when I walk through the door. But I must say, what I've heard tonight has impressed me. Thank you, Liz. That was very good. Question. Um, the, the question I have is about renewable energy. You, you spoke about the, the, the wind farms and the fact that uh, the, the farmers can't use their fields uh, for their animals and to grow a uh, crop. But you know, we're surrounded as an island by the most almighty power, which is tide. And I'm not talking about building barrages, I'm talking about the amount of uh, the current that goes around the, 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 the British Isles. Uh, I live in just outside Bristol. Your question, sir. Sorry, yes. Only because we're, we're, we're short the on tide time. Is nine knots, Let's be expedient. Tidal energy, you're asking? So will you, will you consider tidal energy in your future, future strategy? So yes is the answer. I think it should be. I think it should be part of the solar. And by the way, on solar panels, I'm not against solar panels per se. There are plenty of commercial roofs in Britain where we should be putting solar panels. But where they shouldn't be is on productive agricultural land that should be used for food production. So there's a place for all these technologies, but it needs to be the right place. OK. Um, let's have a look round. I'm just going to get a, a lie of the land. Uh, the lady on the end there with the um, with her hand up there and the glasses on her head. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, what would be your plan to restore water quality in our rivers, um, particularly the River Wye, which uh, is severely impacted by agricultural diffuse pollution? Did you also deal with drought in that question as well, Liz, because of the problems we've been having with, well, water yeah. companies leaching, I think it's 2.4 billion litres of water yeah. um, a day. I mean, the answer is we need to be much tougher on water companies, particularly on leaks and also emitting... Uh, you know, nasty pollutants into rivers. And, you know, in Norfolk, we have some fantastic chalk streams and they are very, very precious. And we need to do all we can to make sure they're protected. So I would make sure the water companies are held to account and also make sure we are dealing with the effluent uh, that is going into our waterways. And what you know, we still have on our statute books, we still have EU environment law. And what I want to do is look at the specific flora and fauna in Britain and how we make sure we protect, um, we protect those endangered species and you know, specific natural habitats like chalk streams here in the United Kingdom. And that is a key law I think we need to change. But at the moment, we're protecting some of the wrong things and we're not protecting the right things. This water company target that was set several years ago to reduce this wastage by 16, 16%. It's not high enough, is it? Why should our bills go up if the water companies can't keep the water in the pipes? I, I agree with you. And I think the problem with a lot of utility regulation is we were one of the first countries to privatise utilities and we created these regulators. But over time, they have become less effective at doing the job. And in some cases, 
they're actually not promoting enough growth and competition as well. So I would review the regulators and how they're operating to make sure they are much more effective. But you're, you're right, water is a natural monopoly and we've got to be tough on the water companies to do the right thing. The chap here in the blue jacket, please. Evening, Liz. Uh, what is your definition of success 90 days having walked through the gates of number 10? So what, what you know, I think the crucial issues we face at the moment, you know, number one is the economy and relieving the burden of people of the cost of living will be very important. I want British businesses and British people to understand we're moving in the right direction and the pressures are being reduced. So that's a very important priority. Priority two is getting the economy growing and sending a real signal to the world and British business that we're on their side and we want to open up opportunities and we want to see new investment. And the third thing we've got to do is really get a grip of waiting lists in the NHS, GPs appointments and dentist appointment. That is a very, very serious issue. It's not good enough at the moment. We need to empower people on the front line. So those would be my first three priorities. But there is a, there is a massive list. I'm not denying it's a challenging time, but those are very important priorities. The chap there um, with the glasses on, um, young chap in the white shirt, please. Thank you. Um, Liz, blending hydrogen into the gas network could diversify UK energy supplies, giving access to hydrogen mega projects around the world. Trials undertaken in the UK by the Hydeploy project have already conclusively shown that domestic gas appliances can operate safely with up to 20% hydrogen with no disruption to consumer, reducing emissions in a conservative way. So, industry are ready to get on and do this, but they're being held up by uncertainty from government. So if you are elected as leader in PM, will you in your first 100 days make a formal policy decision to change regulations, allow blending of hydrogen into the network, and let industry get on and safeguard our energy security? Thank you. I think, I mean, you, you've just made a fantastic point. I think hydrogen is very important. It does work with natural gas. We can use a lot of the same infrastructure, and I support what you're saying. How quickly would you want to start fracking? Well, I would want to get on with all, you know, we've heard about tidal power, we've heard about hydrogen, I've talked about small modular reactors, there's also more gas to be exploited in the North Sea, which I think we could get on stream pretty quickly. And I would want to move as fast as possible with all of those solutions, because energy security is an absolutely key priority, as well as keeping prices low for consumers. And, you know, my view is rather than, and this is the point I'm making about people talking about subsidizing consumers. Of course, you know, we always need to make sure that people are able to you know, live in our society, that they are able to get by. But we've got to look at the root cause of what these energy costs are and why they're being generated and what we can do to deal with these supplies. And frankly, we've been too slow. You know, we've been too slow on nuclear, we've been too slow on hydrogen, we've been too slow on these other technologies. So I would get them going as soon as possible. Um, the lady over there, um, second row in. Sorry, I'm making, <laughs> I'm making the guys in the hoodies run around um, the auditorium. You're getting your steps up, don't worry. Liz, I gather you, are a re you were a Remainer, and I have to applaud you the way that I have seen on the TV you racing around the globe making trade deals and whatever. But I don't seem to read about the trade deals and whether they're working. Can you tell me how many are actually up and running, totally confirmed, and actually giving a benefit to Britain? Yeah. So there are, there are just over 70. I think there have been a few more signs since I left the trade department. But all of those are in place. And we were working right up to the 31st of December, getting those in place to make sure that businesses could continue to trade and in some cases could get better deals than they'd had under the EU. But you know, we've, today we're sponsored by The Telegraph. And I would love the media to spend more time talking about, We've trade, deals. about trade deals. Yeah, I mean, You've the thing for is, us on trade deals. I have written for you on trade deals. But 
you know, the point is that what trade deals is they open the door for business, but then we need to help businesses actually get their products into market. We set up the export support service to help do that. But I would love to see the press write, write about that rather than about political you, rows. But you happy sometimes, with the press this week because you've had a bit of a go at us. Well, I had a go at Tom Newton Dunn, but wow. you're, asking, you're asking much sounder we'll forgive questions, you Camilla. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, the lady well, over she there. she is, isn't she? I'm sorry, you know, yeah, she is. The lady over there with the spotty dress, I think. Thanks, and, and thanks, Liz. Um, I think everybody in this room and Conservative members around the country are going to come behind whoever is our next leader and Prime Minister. So my question to you... My question to you this evening is, when it comes to the general election in 2024, or whenever it comes, what are the three things about you that are going to make sure that we bring swing voters along and hold on to the seats we won in 2019 and, and gain in other areas? Well, it's, first of all, I will not have an election before 2024. I think that's a very important point. And because we, we've got to deliver for people. And that is my number one point, that in 2019, we promised that we would deliver. We promised we'd level up the country. We promised we'd deliver broadband. We promised we'd deliver you know, less NHS waiting lists, more doctors, more police officers. We've got to deliver all that stuff, and we've got to show people that things are getting better. And that, for me, is about opening opportunities, getting more investment, getting spades in the ground, get, getting economic growth. And even I, though I'm a pretty fast mover, I appreciate it will take some time to make that happen. So delivery is the number one point. The second point about me is that I don't make promises I can't keep. And I am a straightforward person who tells it like it is. And I think that is something that people across the country appreciate. And I've certainly found that when I'm traveling around and, uh, and talking to people around the country. And the third way that I will win the next election is making sure we're using all of the Conservative team. During this leadership race, we've seen some fantastic candidates. I'm delighted uh, that Penny Mordaunt and Tom Tugendhat are now backing my campaign. Uh, we've also got Rishi, Kemi, you know, all really, really competent people. And what I want to see is a less presidential number 10, and one that really presents a team of fantastic Conservatives who deliver for people right across the country. So, so the three things I will do is, first of all, I will deliver. Secondly, I will be honest and make sure people can trust me. And thirdly, I will do it as a team. OK, I'm looking at four minutes left on the clock. So let's have rapid fire questions and answers. A man is so eager for me to pick him there with the sunglasses on his shirt. There. Stand up, if you will, sir, and then he can see you easily. Here, sorry. There we are. He's got his sunglasses on indoors, which is well, bold. Do you know that it's hotter in Cheltenham than it is in Florida today? Why aren't we staycationing after this? Well, we are. Staycationing. Well, we, we may as well. Let's go to the Cotswolds. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Liz. Lovely to see you. Um, you made two points about the environment, which received rapturous applause in here. And I have to say, as a Conservative voter for nine years, it would receive the absolute opposite outside. Green levy is £150 off a bill. That does not touch the side, probably of most people in the room, their bills. And secondly, I have, there is a question here. Secondly, you say you'll, you go past Farmer's Field and you're horrified to see solar panels. You'll be even more horrified in a few years with drought, with crop failure, and everything else caused by the climate emergency. Cutting green levies now sends the wrong message to business and it sends the wrong message to people. Yeah. Do you think that's good enough? So I do not believe I do not believe we can tax ourselves to growth and I don't believe we should tax ourselves to net zero. I want to achieve net zero, but I want to do it in a way that harnesses capital, that harnesses investment, that harnesses the city of London to actually invest in the new technologies. So we've heard about these fantastic ideas like hydrogen, tidal power, but I'm afraid Things like the green energy levy are yet another example of us taxing ordinary people rather than finding new innovative ways of bringing businesses in, bringing investment in, to solve what are technological problems. And I don't agree it needs to be that way. 
I was an environmental activist before it was fashionable. I campaigned in the 1990s to protect the ozone layer, and it was Mrs. Thatcher who signed the Montreal Accord to protect it. But we don't need to accept that environmental goods have to come through left-wing solutions. And fundamentally, I'm about investment and growth, not tax and spend. The chap here, please. The chap here has been waiting patiently. Yes, sir. Good evening, uh, Liz. Um, my name's Harry from South West Wiltshire. Um, just really, um, we make it a priority for um, time to be given so we can push through the national disability strategy and that way it would really truly level up um, for all of disability um, all around the country and truly for us uh, disability conservatives that's a key tenant surely of leveling up instead of it being blocked uh, by court challenges yeah. um, can we get on and make this a key tenant in the next parliament? Thank you, sir. The, an the answer is yes. I, I, fully, I fully support the strategy. I'm working closely with Chloe Smith in the uh, Women and Equalities Department. And you're, you're absolutely right. What we need to be making sure is that everybody in our country has those opportunities, including people with disabilities. We need to get on with the strategy. And I can tell you, I will make sure it gets unblocked and it gets implemented. Thank you. Uh, the man there in the check shirt, blue and white check shirt, please. Oh, hang on, wait for the microphone. Unless you're Brian Blessed. Yes, please, that guy there. Liz, you've made a great play of your plans to cut back national insurance contributions, which has certainly grabbed the headlines, and maybe that was your intention. To analyse national insurance contributions is complex because of different levels of contribution. What I have found is that it accounts for less than 7% of our national income. Um, not very much, so the reduction you promise is very little, which you claim will put money into consumers' pockets, okay. which and they will go out and spend, boosting our struggling economy. I doubt that people, I doubt that, people will use the extra little bit of net income they have to pay their heating bills okay. this winter and will not boost our economy. Sir, Would you like to sir, comment on that? Sir, you're saying that the uh, changes to the levy, scrapping the levy, isn't going to make well, enough no, money. He was asking about national insurance. The point about national insurance is, first of all, we promised not to raise it in our manifesto. Secondly, we didn't need to do it because we can afford to pay for the NHS increase out of general taxation. And third, you know, this money is important to people. This is money that we are currently taking, not just from hardworking families, but also from small businesses, also from the public sector, who have to pay those extra national insurance contributions. And I think it is wrong at a time when we are facing economic difficulties to put up taxes. I think it's fundamentally unconservative. We didn't need to do it, and it's a drag on the economy. We should be doing all we can, including scrapping the or moratorium on the green energy levy, to save people money on their bills and to put more money in people's pockets. And I believe it's their money, not our money. This is taxpayers' money. And too often we seem to forget that and think it's free money. It isn't. People work hard to earn that money and we should take as little off them as we possibly can. I can see... I can see that our time is up. Liz Truss, thank you very much. Thank and you. good luck. Thank you. Just to explain to the sound guys, I've had to take this out of my ear because it was whistling like I was picking up, I don't know, uh, some sort of distant radio station. So without further ado, let's welcome on to the stage Rishi Sunak. Hello, how, how are, are you? you? I'm you very right? well, thanks. Take right, a seat. Wow. I've just been thinking the last time you and I sat together was in the Pret-a-Manger in Marsham Street and you were running the government consultation into disabled toilets. 
That's and right. A, a lot's happened yes. in the preceding years. Now, um, you said yesterday, you came up with this remarkable statement that you'd rather lose than win an off false promise. One bookmaker today has said that Liz is two to one ahead with the members. You've talked uh, very passionately about the cost of living crisis facing this country. We've got the CBI's Tony Danker saying the government's asleep at the wheel. There's a vacuum of power. Why not just step aside if she looks like she's going to win and for the benefit of the company, country, let her go and be PM? I, for, the, for the simple reason that I'm fighting for what I believe is right for our country. And... Then why do you think Chris Skidmore has defected from you to trust then? Oh, well, look, I've, look, everyone's, I've got a lot of respect for all my colleagues. I'm still very proud of the fact that in the parliamentary stage of this, I led in every single round. I topped the ballot in every single round. I have the most support from members of parliament. And actually, it's not just numbers. If you look at it, it's a breadth of support that I'm proud about. It's from parliamentary colleagues from across the spectrum. People who voted for Brexit voted Remain, urban seats, rural seats, newer colleagues, most experienced colleagues. I'm really proud to have all their support. And I'm going to, as I said, we're, in the, we're only halfway through this thing. I'm going to fight till the last day with everything I've got because I'm fighting for what I believe in. And if you do lose, what happens? Do you quit politics? I say that simply because of the green card thing maybe some aspirations in America. What would happen next for Rishi Sunak? I, I, I mean, I'm... <laughs> There's no point booing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there are questions that people want answered. I'm sorry. No, well, I, sadly, you're not going to get rid of me that easily, Camilla, all I can say. Uh... So no plans to move to America? No. Hey, I, you know, I, you know, several years ago, my, my members in Richmond, North Yorkshire, did me the enormous honour of selecting me as their candidate. And it's a great privilege to carry on representing them for as long as they'll have me. OK, so I asked this question to Liz specifically in mind of Martin Lewis's comments today. Google search is going up exponentially for how will I pay my bills. Uh, the Telegraph reporting that bills might go up to £5,000 next January. What specifically and exactly are you going to do to bring bills down? And I'm not talking about tax cuts in two years' time. I'm talking about immediate relief and help for families, in addition to what was announced in the budget. Yes. I think there are three different ways to think about it. The first is, I think everyone will need some help because the scale of the challenge we're facing is just that considerable. And what I've said is, very quickly, after taking office, I will cut VAT on energy bills, and that will provide an extra around £200 of support for all families. Is that and that will, Well, that will come on top of the support that I announced as Chancellor, which is worth about £550 to everyone. But then there are two other groups of people who need extra help. And I talked about them earlier on. It's the most vulnerable in our society. People who don't have an easy way of increasing their incomes, don't have sufficient savings to dip into, and that's people on very low incomes and pensioners. Now, no tax cut, and Liz's tax plan, is not going to help those groups of people, right? So scrapping the health and social care levy, as she wants to do, is worth £1,700 to her on her salary. For someone working really hard on the national living wage, it's worth just over a quid a week. And for someone who's a pensioner, without any earnings, it's worth zero. Now, I want to provide direct support to those groups of people. But what are you actually proposing? Are you proposing a sort of reboot of furlough, but for no. energy bills? No. And no, how no. much is it going to cost? No, no, and no. isn't that, in turn, going to be inflationary? No, no. actually, I've already announced the chance for a mechanism to do it, and it's to provide direct financial support to those groups of people. There'll be many pensioners here in the audience tonight. They're used to receiving a winter fuel payment in the winter. And what I did as Chancellor is say that we will provide additional payments alongside that, and we will need to provide more than I thought previously because the bills are worse. And we need to do the same for people on low incomes. Now, there are existing mechanisms to do that. That's what I said as Chancellor. I will do more as Prime Minister. But if we don't do that, and this is for everyone, should just consider this point. If you support a plan that Liz is suggesting, which says she doesn't believe in doing that, doesn't believe in providing direct financial support to those groups of people, and that's what she said, because she thinks her tax cut is going to help them, which it is not, we are going to, as a Conservative government, leave millions of incredibly vulnerable people at the risk of real destitution. Now, I think that is a moral failure. And I think 
people, people will be, of course, in agreement with you when you're talking about people who are on universal credit, when you're talking about people who are on the state pension. But it has been noted that there's been a lack of help from you, from people who are sole traders, from people who are running small and medium-sized businesses. You're running a business in this country, and you're looking at Rishi Sunak as Chancellor, and you're saying, hang on a minute, he's put up my national insurance contribution, so I'm doubly taxed. Hang on a minute, he's putting up corporation tax. What incentive do I have to run a small business okay. in this country? Well, well let's, let's just look at what happened for all those small businesses over the last couple of years. The fact that they're all still here today is because of the things that I did over the last two years. Right, so no, 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 for that, but no, no, but let's, let's, let's talk, finish the question, right? Because energy, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dwelling on, I'm not dwelling up on as the much past. As anybody, let's talk about this year. Now, one of the industries that I passionately believe in when you talk about small businesses is the hospitality industry. Incredibly important across our economy for the number of people it employs. Actually, what, what are we doing this year? We've cut their business rates by 50%. What are we doing to help with their employment costs? Cut their employment taxes by a thousand pounds. I announced that as chancellor in my last budget. I'm also helping and them grow, the and rises, I'm also though. helping them grow and innovate. Actually, one of the things we have in this country, which we need to do a better job of, is supporting our small businesses to grow and innovate, use new technology, and that's why I created a program called Help to Grow. It provides them with mini MBAs. It provides them with software to get online to make sure their business can be even more profitable. That's what I'm doing for small businesses. And you talk about corporation tax. 70% of UK registered companies aren't going to see any change in their corporation tax under my plan, so they are going to be protected from that. But 30 are, and corporation tax is going up, and the Tory manifesto said it wouldn't. No, actually, the Tory manifesto said it would stay where it was, but we've so had a pandemic. We, we, we've, had, we've, had, we've had a pandemic since then. But look, let's talk about it. Yes, corporation tax is going to go up for the largest businesses under my plan, because I think that's a reasonable and fair thing to do in the circumstances. But as I said, Remember that 70% of companies won't see an increase, so small businesses are protected. The second thing you need to know is the rate that it is going up to is still the lowest in the G7 group of countries that we compete with. So it's still lower than America, France, Italy, Germany, Japan, Canada. Let's broaden it out to the 20 largest countries that we compete with. We'll still have the fourth lowest rate. So it's a very internationally competitive rate, but I'll tell you what you need to know most importantly is that alongside that, as I said in my speech, we are going to radically cut taxes for businesses that actually do the right things to grow our economy. That's businesses that invest more, businesses that innovate more. That's where our tax system isn't very generous. That's how you drive growth and productivity and create jobs in a modern economy. So I want to cut the taxes on the things that work, not just sound okay, good. So why, so why are Liz, why are Liz Trust tax what? cuts? Inflationary, well, Liz, Liz, and why, why aren't your tax cuts inflationary? Because Liz, Liz, Tuss, Liz Truss's corporation tax plan is simply wrong. We've tried, we've tried it for 10 years. And let me tell you all, business investment in this country today is no greater than it was a decade ago. It hasn't worked, the experiment on corporation tax rate. It just simply hasn't worked. If you want to drive growth in a modern economy, you need businesses to invest. Business investment in this country lags almost every other advanced economy. Why? There are many reasons, but one of them is that our tax treatment of it is not generous enough, and that's why we should focus our tax cuts on the things that actually will grow our economy, and that's why it's not inflationary. If you cut taxes for a business that is expanding its factory, putting in a new production line, putting in robotics to increase its productivity, that's how you create more products in a country. Okay. That's how you reduce inflation because but they are proper supply side tax cuts. What's confusing people I think is you sort of making a comment on the economy that you are in charge of. You know, why didn't you predict, for instance, the inflationary nature of quantitative easing? So, why didn't so, you do anything about that? So, well, you talk about corporation tax. Yes, and that's why I want to change easing. it. I'm talking about quantitative well, easing. Well, Some I, of the inflationary measures that were put in place by the Bank of England have proved to be disastrous. That happened under your watch. So why are you now saying to people, well, I'm going to repair the economy that has been damaged under your watch, some would argue? Well, I think when it comes to the Bank of England, I think maybe unlike what you just said and unlike what Liz is saying, I believe in Bank of England independence. I think it's an Even important if thing. The wrong I think it's a very important thing. And, and I think actually I'm very nervous about things I hear elsewhere, about people who seem to think that from Liz's camp and her that we should scrap Bank of England independence. I think that would be a massive mistake for our country, and international investors would really not look very kindly on it at all. But, 
But, but what if the Bank of England does things that seem to exacerbate the problem rather than solve it? The Bank of England has an independent mandate. It is set by the government, and it's right. And it's, it's right that we are tough in making sure that we set the mandate right. I did that. But it's also worth considering there has been a war on, Camilla. Mm. The, the, the reason that energy prices are where they are in the first instance is because we collectively decided, rightly, to be robust in standing up to Russian aggression, that has led to higher energy prices, and, and, and we have to acknowledge that that is a big part of the reason we're suffering from inflation. This question came up quite a lot with subscribers, so I'm going to ask it. If you are this sort of beacon of fiscal discipline, why did you veto chasing the 17 billion in fraudulent COVID loans? Well, that, well that's, uh, that's just simply not right. I mean, who, who on earth has said that? That's completely absurd. Well, you, you did have a Treasury Minister resigning over what he described was your schoolboy tactics and failing to grasp well, the issue. Well, may, maybe he and everyone else should read the report that was just published the other week. So did that people actually fraudulently show... take loans or not? And did it happen on the Treasury's watch? It, it, it happens across the entirety of government spending. But what you need to realise now, because of the mechanisms that I put in place, the extra teams that are out recovering this stuff, the arrests that are being made, the new laws that we passed, the new agency at the National Crime Agency, the estimated fraud, fraud in furlough now is actually estimated to be lower than a typical government program. And that's something I set up in a matter of weeks in the middle of a crisis. So actually, I'm very proud of my record on furlough, and I'm proud that we have gone after those who abused it. As a simple matter of fairness, it's wrong, and we will relentlessly pursue them. So was the Treasury Minister wrong to resign? Yes, he was. Um why is Simon Clark and Kwasi Kwarteng, your former cabinet colleagues, writing in the Telegraph saying that you re resisted attempts to cut Brexit red tape, uh, that you uh, weren't committed to overhauling the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, that you blocked EU insolvency too being changed? Are you just a nominal Brexiteer? I, I, I mean, a greatest respect for all my colleagues, so I'm not going to get engaged in, in this, but I would just gently point out that neither Kwasi nor Simon Clark had anything to do with Solvency 2 and financial services regulation. That was done entirely by myself and John Glenn. And actually, there is a bill that is ready to introduce in Parliament as soon as I become Prime Minister that will radically change not just Solvency 2, but all of our financial services regulations. But what about this general accusation, and maybe it comes from the right of the party, but it's unfair, that you sort of were taken hostage by the Treasury, a Treasury that we know is institutionally opposed to Brexit and constantly obsessing about EU markets rather than perhaps what the I know they, you know what they, they, they were. public voted for. Yeah, they, they were, Camilla, they were. And you know what? When they said that, I didn't listen to them. I voted for Brexit. But there was someone else who held up their Treasury documents. It wasn't me. It was Liz Truss at the time. OK, so I'm very prepared to confront the consensus. Actually, on corporation tax, that's what we're doing. We're challenging consensus. On EU regulations, who's come up with a policy that actually takes advantage of Brexit in a radical way, creating free ports around the country? I did that. Right? Who's actually scrapping EU laws off the statute book, replacing them with the British regulatory system in financial services? That's what I'm doing. I'm frustrated that I haven't seen that degree of radicalism across government. That's what I want to change. Right? So that, this idea that somehow I'm not Brexity enough, I just find very puzzling. Let's talk about your fellow Brexiteer, Boris Johnson, um, to conclude before we go to audience questions. Um, this Privilege Committee investigation, the goalposts have changed a bit. It was going to find out whether he had deliberately misled Parliament. Now it's just going to find out if he misled. Do you support that or do you think he should be recused of this investigation now? So uh, all I would say is that the MPs on the committee are the ones that make decisions, and I fully support What's your them. Opinion on it. Well, it's a parliamentary. Actually, I haven't followed every twist and turn of it, to be well, honest. I've, I've been busy being an out and about. Uh, it, it's a parliamentary process, not a government process. There's a difference between them, and I fully respect the MPs that are on the committee to make the right decisions. I personally believe very strongly in high standards. One of the things I would do almost immediately as Prime Minister is reinstate an independent advisor for ministerial interests, because everyone needs to know that trust, integrity and decency belong at the heart of politics and I will lead from the front. Have you uh, spoken to Mr Johnson since you resigned? I, you know, I have, I, I've messaged and called but unsurprisingly he hasn't returned my calls. So. <laughs> um, right, let's go to audience questions please. Right. Put your hands straight up. Um, let's take this lady in the blue on, on the end here please. Hi, Rishi. Um, I'm Penny Ann. I'm the National Voluntary Director for the CPF. 
Um, how would you ensure that your policy team engages with the CPF regularly and gets our feedback? And also, I was very um, interested to hear that you want every child to have a world-class education. As a speech and language therapist, I'm concerned that 69% of young offenders have undiagnosed speech and language needs and also the reading age between four and eight years of age. So how do we ensure it truly is a world-class education system for everybody, including those with special educational needs? Thank you for the, for the excellent question. So it's been a real privilege to work with John Penrose and all your colleagues while I was Chancellor, and thank you for all the ideas that you sent. So look, quick, quickly on, on the early years, and that's actually the point that I was going to make, because you talked about kids at a very early age, and you're right. Because if we now look at all the negative outcomes we see in society, not just educationally, but all the other social ills, that we see in our older adults or late teens, what's clear is if we could have solved them at a very early age, we would have made an enormous difference. Because actually, if you look at the inequality that exists in our school system when children leave school, most of it was there when they arrived. So if we actually can tackle things much earlier, as you said, focusing on those very early years, whether it's four-year-olds, five-year-olds, we can make an enormous difference. And I made some of that changes as Chancellor, starting to focus more of our resources earlier on, and it's something I think we should keep doing. Now, to your other question, now, if you've got five minutes, I put it online on Conhome. It's called a contract with members. And it's what I want to do for the party, because we've talked a lot about what we'll do for the country in this uh, election. But for the party, what I want to do is make sure we actually regularly have a survey of all of you. It's a simple idea, but we don't do it currently. And I, what I'd like to do is make sure we have regular surveys of your opinions. But even better than that, there's no point just asking you what you think. What, I want to, what I've committed to is not only will we have those surveys, but that those topics will get discussed explicitly at political cabinet so that all of you feel that your participation and support of the party is being recognised and discussed at the highest levels so that we are all on the same team. And that's just one of the few changes I want to make. I was going to ask on education because it was a subject of that lady's question. Obviously, lots have been made about uh, your wife's family wealth and things. You do appreciate, of course, as a Winchester schoolboy, that you were afforded opportunities that have not been offered to many, many, yes. many children in the UK. What will you do about that? Uh, I, uh, yes, I have. But, and I, and I'm, I am absolutely, as you saw from me on the stage, I'm not going to apologise for what my parents did for me. You must be joking. Good evening, Rishi. Good evening. Um, so many of our public services um, just don't seem to be working. Yeah. Uh, I know we've been through a pandemic, but I think the fact of life, from my perspective, is when we get to 2024 in an election, if all these things, and I'm not going to rattle out the whole list, everything from the NHS or ambulance or border force, or today we hear about police forces, the list is endless. It's almost like nothing is working. And whoever is Prime Minister, I think will get booted out in 2024 unless there are major improvements. And I think that will just be a fact of life because yeah. people will say we need to change because the, the phrase used to be Labour wasn't working. It was a great slogan of ours some years back. I think probably Keir Starmer and co will be able to demonstrate that the Tory government yeah. is not working because so many of these things will still be below standard. Now, what are you going to fix it? Yep. And I'm not talking about highfalutin ideas. I'm talking at the coal face yep. where delivery counts. Yep. Well, sir, your question is absolutely right. And let, look, there's so much we could talk about. I'm going to focus on one thing because it's probably the most important, and that's the NHS. Right? It's the NHS that is the most used public service. It's the thing that people care about the most. And right now, it's not working as well as it should. And I'll give you one very simple idea of what I want to do. You said a coalface thing. Because we're going to have to act boldly and radically if we're going to change the dynamic here, if we're going to actually solve these problems. So I want to tackle the issue that no one has bothered tackling for years, and that is the issue of missed NHS appointments. Because there are 15 million missed appointments every year in the NHS, not just at GPs, but at hospitals too. And that's wrong. It's not valuing our doctors properly, but it's also, more importantly, depriving people of care that they urgently need, making them wait unnecessarily long. So I've said I want to get tough on this. Now, lots of people are going to say, oh, gosh, well, you can't do that, or it's too hard, or you're being too different, tough on people. No. No, we've got to be radical and bold. But if we can solve that problem, and it's not about making money when I want to find people, it's about changing behavior. Because if we can get people to cancel those appointments in advance, even a few of them, we have created millions more NHS capacity to treat everyone who needs it, 
and treat them faster, and none of us have paid an extra penny to do that. So there's a simple idea of what if we can make it work, we'll make an enormous difference to tackling the backlogs, and that is just one thing we can do, but you, that kind of radicalism and grip is what I will bring to all the challenges that we face. You saw me do it in the pandemic, and I will do it as Prime Minister across government. Rishi, can you just uh, give us a bit more detail on that? Are you saying that you want to charge people for appointments or fine them if they miss them? And if you want to it, it, fine them, fines, how, fines much, are you thinking? how yeah, much are you thinking? F fines for missed. How much? Yeah, I, I've said indicatively £10, but the point here is not about to, it's not, the point is not about to making money. The point is about, for the first time in our society, changing the culture where it shouldn't be acceptable to miss appointments because you're depriving people of care. Uh, the lady here in the white. Thank you. Uh, Liz mentioned that she would increase the defence budget by 3%. Where do you sit supporting our military? Yes. Well, first of all, let me tell you about my track record. I made sure that we found an extra billion pounds to send to Ukraine just recently from elsewhere across government spending. I made sure that everyone prioritised differently. We could take the money and send it there because they needed it. It's the right thing to do. I was also the Chancellor that, alongside the PM and the Defence Secretary, oversaw the largest increase in defence spending since the end of the Cold War. And we did that in the middle of the pandemic because the threats were rising and the MOD needed to have the security of funding to deal with them. So that's my record. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you 3% because I don't believe in arbitrary targets when it comes to something as important as our security. So what I will tell you is simple. I will invest whatever it takes to keep all of you and our country safe because that is the first duty of a prime minister and it's certainly the first duty of a conservative prime minister. Let's take uh, the chat right out at the back um, in the white the the shirt top. with his, with his ha hand up. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about um, your thoughts, Rishi, in the sense that normally you don't raise taxes and interest rates just ahead of a recession. I'm a fund manager, and normally, over my 40-year career, any country that's raised the tighten fiscal and monetary policy at the same time hasn't particularly ended well. Can I have your thoughts on that, please? Yeah, so look, we, we have a situation at the moment where inflation is spiralling to 13% interest rates are already on the rise, right? So for what, forget about the moral argument against borrowing, which I, I make and I will passionately continue making till the day this thing is ending, because many of you might say, I don't care, it doesn't matter, we'll push it off to another day. I don't think that's remotely conservative, but we can argue the toss. I think it is an enormous gamble to put 50 billion pounds of borrowed money into an economy that is already seeing spiraling inflation and rising interest rates. Maybe it'll be all fine, maybe it will right? Because these things you never know. But it is an enormous gamble with people's savings, their pensions, and their mortgage rates. And it's not a gamble that I'm prepared to take. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Uh, there's a blonde lady just here in this, this, sorry, this section with your hand up there. Yes, yeah, she's being pointed to by the man next to her with blonde hair. Put your hand up again, uh, madam. Thank you. Uh, yes, the there we are. Dress, yeah. Good evening. Um, mindful that Taiwan makes more than 90% of uh, the most modern semiconductors, which uh, we depend on in all aspects of modern life. If China invades, what's your plan? Yeah. So, well, look, I, well, first of all, we need to make sure that we continue supporting our allies in the region. And there's lots of different ways we can do that to act as a deterrence to China, one of which we recently did when we sent our aircraft carrier to the region. Another one is our new partnership, the AUKUS partnership with Australia and the US to demonstrate our commitment to the region. Another thing is standing up for our values, as you saw when it came to Hong Kong, where it was right that we robustly stood up to China, because they do represent the biggest threat to our economic and thereby our national security. Now, that's why I actually, as Chancellor, passed a new law to make sure that we can protect this country against hostile foreign investment that is coming here to steal our technology or infiltrate our companies. As Prime Minister, I would use those powers. But you also make a broad point as well about resilience of our supply chains, because it's not just semiconductors. If you think about what one of the great transformations that's going to happen over the next 20 years as we move towards net zero is the electrification of our car fleet, as we all use electric cars. There's no point in us doing that if for those rare earth minerals that those batteries rely on all come from China. So we need to start now figuring out with our allies like Canada, Australia, America, a supply chain that means we are not reliant on China for new things that are going to be critical to our future economic success and security. And that's the type of strategy and approach that I would take to that problem. Nice. 
let's go to this chap here because he's got arm ache. He's had his arm up for so long. Sorry. I can't, I can't feel my arm. No. <laughs> um, good evening, Rishi. Uh, I am chairman of a cancer, a rare cancer charity, and a trustee of Cancer 52, which ought to be renamed Cancer 54 because 54 percent of cancer deaths are from rare and less common cancers. What are you going to do as a commitment to help Dame Carly Palmer and David Fitzgerald in the National Cancer Programme in order to ensure that rare and less common cancers have more of a profile and get more money? Yeah. Well, thank you for the incredible work you do in that space. Now, when I talked earlier about building an economy built on innovation, I mean it in all its guises. And one thing that we are incredible at in this country is life sciences. And we all saw that during the pandemic the most advanced economy for genomic sequencing, the first is vaccine, or antiviral trials working really well here. So that is a glimpse of what is possible in this country, so I'm optimistic that we can continue to innovate to help solve some of life's most pressing challenges and keep people safer and healthier for longer. So that's why the NHS budget that I was proud to oversee over the last couple of years has the largest investment in health R&D that this country has seen. Because if we're going to build that innovation economy of the future that not is just good for jobs and growth, but also is doing life-changing things to keep us all healthy, it means that we need to have a research base that is as vibrant as it needs to be. That's why we are increasing our R&D budget and why a big chunk of it is going to health. It's also why we need to take advantage of our Brexit freedoms that I talked about. When it comes to clinical trials, I want to make sure we do that differently so we can get drugs through much faster. It's why I funded genomic sequencing, because we can now do screening at a far earlier age to detect things. It's why I was in California in December meeting companies that have new blood tests that can detect all these cancers and more far faster than we've ever been able to do it. Now, that is a vision of the future that I want to build in this country, because if we can get that right, then not only can we create the jobs and prosperity, we can keep people healthier and safer for longer, and I'm confident that I can build the type of country that will do exactly that. But thank you so much for what you do, because it's very important. Okay. Rishi, we're down to three minutes, so three quick, minutes. quick questions, quick answers. The lady there with her um, spotty dress. Thank you. Oh, right, yes, three minutes. Quick That's questions, yeah. quick answers, please. Thank you. Um, Rishi, my question is more about you as a person as opposed to policy. I was very undecided um, and was able, to, as a district councillor, to go on a Zoom call with Liz and then a few days later a Zoom call with yourself. Um, I've come here tonight very much still undecided, but the key thing for me is about you and Liz as a person. Now, all of us here tonight are extremely, um, it's extremely important to us about what our next Prime Minister does for the country, but it's extremely important as to what we do, or you do, or Liz does, to win us a large majority in the next general election. Now, what that means is you engaging with the electorate. Now, your passion, from what I've seen tonight and on the Zoom calls, your passion for what you believe in could possibly be portrayed as if somebody doesn't believe the same thing as you do, it could be that they are wrong, as opposed to take them with us. So how will you engage with the electorate to ensure that we have a large majority at the next general election? Right, fine. Well, that's probably a good one to end on, right? So, yeah. should we, so that's a good one. So look, there's a couple of things we're going to need to do to support you and all our other fantastic councillors win. Now, I talked about my contract with members, actually, because that's an important part of it. One thing I want to do is raise far more money than we've ever raised in our party for one very particular purpose, and that is to put dedicated campaign managers in all of our target areas across the entire United Kingdom. Because you deserve the support on the ground. But in terms of appealing to people, the people that we need to appeal to, and people in swing seats everywhere, right, they are not actually that ideological. Right? The people in the middle are broadly comfortable with lots of different things, but what they want is a government that works properly, as a gentleman was saying. Right? And that is what I will do. The most powerful thing I can do to appeal to those people, for all of us, all those non-ideological swing voters, is what they want is a government that works competently, seriously, with decency and integrity at the heart of everything it does. That's the type of change I'm going to bring. That's the type of government I'm going to lead. And that's how we're going to win the election. Couple more questions. This chap here. On the end here, yeah, with the black jacket on, sir. Thank you. Be as quick as you can, both questioner and answer. Yes, thank you. Considering the age of everyone in here, and uh, the Conservatives um, totally screwed the pensioners by stopping the, uh, the triple lock, what, what are you going to be doing about that? 
The question is right, sorry. Oh, so it wasn't a question about young people in the end. Right, sorry. Right, so pensioners, the triple lock is back. It will be back, and next spring your pension will probably go up by around 10% plus, I would imagine, because that's where inflation will be in the autumn. And it goes back to what I was saying before, because I do believe that we should give people in retirement dignity. That's what a Conservative government does. And that's why, going back to what we talked about right at the beginning, millions of pensioners this autumn and winter are going to have an extraordinarily tough time. They don't have the ability to go out and work more hours. They're already dipping into their savings in retirement. And as I said then, and I'll say it again, if we don't provide direct support to millions of vulnerable pensioners, it will be a moral failure of this party and the country will never, ever forgive us. Very quick question to then, because we've gone old, let's go young, because this chap here seems to be probably one of the youngest people in the audience. Let's ask him the final question. We all continue to hear more and more about the struggles with young people's mental health. Yeah. This is particularly so as we emerge from COVID and the impact of our well-being, our social and our academic development after nearly losing two years due to lockdowns. What are you planning to do about the mental health crisis affecting the younger generation who are the future of this country? Yeah, very good. Right. So thank you. Thank you for the question. Look, I, I have two young girls, they're 9 and 11. I'll tell you one very specific thing we have to do is, look, like many of you in this room as parents and grandparents, you know, my eldest one has got her iPad, she's about to start doing things on her own, and I am quite frankly petrified about what she's going to see and see and read and be exposed to online. And it is clear that it is an enormous enormous cause of mental health challenges for young, particularly girls. And so what I want to do is make sure that we quickly pass a new law in Parliament that we've been working on that puts a much tighter obligation on big digital companies to police the online world in exactly the same way as we would police the world that we walk around in. Because there is nothing more precious than our children and young people's innocence. They should, be they should not be denied that right. And I, first and foremost, not as Prime Minister, as a dad, will make sure that we do that. So bring back the online safety bill. Yeah, brilliant. Perfect. Right. Thank you very much, Rishi Sunak. Thanks very much. The time is up. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. All right. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize 
as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there. Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering, we pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. We were singing, when you were singing, the masters of the field were coming. We Uwarian boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We Uwarian boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust in God. God. And that's for Opoku Masters mm -hmm. are coming. Masters are coming. Mm -hmm. Masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. Masters are coming. And then they will sing. <laughs> 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 then we go more. Then we will keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then you will sing. Ah, when they tire, they will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens. Diplo, Owens. Are we again? We have to win the race and take a cup. We are the masters of the field and best athletes, famous to all and decent boys. How deployed. Then they will start. I've been quiet. 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 Ni e levy because e levy problem no a e simple now Ghana government is on person or TSA in Tina Bet much then no what TSA ye it was your for 2020 IMF ma Ghana one billion dollars billion with a B same year no World Bank ma Ghana 430 million dollars nina for covid e we e chi no in 2021 no imf for some magana 1 billion dollars bill 1 billion with a b na world bank for some magana 130 million dollars in 20 to 2021 no so 1 billion 130 million yeah if he world bank buy any imf buy no now we say post covid Rejuvenation program say what be ma young economy no so into no World Bank and IMF this is Ghana ma Ghana Ghana government call Bank of Ghana koyi 20 billion cities say COVID in T Nebuchadnezzar for what World Bank ama mu 2 billion uh IMF ama mu 2 billion World Bank ama mu 560 million dollars for COVID I know on some Musan call Bank of Ghana could eat 20 billion CDs. Say COVID in tea. Say she can we move home contain trying yet. And I won't be. We move yet. Baby, I will be for Ghana. E levy tax. We call ports. E levy. We call airports. We call hotels. But what they are to to be beer as for Ghana. E levy. E levy. E levy. Say she can he na fa petrol. E levy. We call union ma port. E levy. Says he can hear now, Fana. In this, a ne government a person or tray and say Ghana for a be a yard in a year, Jumentina or de sa eleven or by yes, you perceive a tray government to say, and you say, I do in year, you move you who never cosono near Jay Amano. If you say, whoop, say, wound ya eleven young, yeah, yeah, responsible citizens, young person, yeah, 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 stand by, yet, Jina Hockey car, yet, train fire. Or not okay, so yes, yeah, responsible citizens, right? Into yeah, yeah, responsible citizens. Now the thing is, so what per se would free sika? Now would the ye be beer? Because young credit rating record former. And yeah, young abra bought now the e levy barber to so. I didn't because there is over three, almost three billion Ghana cities record to the presidency. 
3 billion Ghana. Into it also by 75%. What also by 75%? I will say by 375 million dollars. 375 million. Save you and not at the presidency. You don't need 3 billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what are you? Mr. Kufuado. And the near Koso war presidency. Then now Mudi Sikani a presidency war. Mudi a den, Mudi Shusruku, and I den now Mudi a. Legislature, leg, Ghana legislators, you yeah, have well, 275 legislators. Then as our legislators know, what you have Ghana. Say, say, minimum, can say, hey, Ghana, if we, you bet me, after I install it, Watson, IBM computer, what friend is Watson, no? Ah, a yeah, artificial intelligence, a ah. bet yeah, nine, over 90% of young parliamentarians, no? You bet me I replace one with Watson. Watson computer by one Juma. Now, you downscale. I then you hear 275 parliamentarians out. Then we are Magana. One liability to Ghanaians in a year over 100,000 cities every month per parliamentarian. 100,000 cities. Kona kubun kunta na he. And we see what judiciary. Judiciary he. America ye 330 million people. 11 times the size of Ghana. Ghana is 30.8 million. America were nine Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado Bana saying Ghana near were 10 Supreme Court judges. A Kufuado are 28. I can't. In to say, say Ghana, 30, a, a country of less than 31 million people, no, yeah, were 18 Supreme Court judges. Ding, near how young 18. Then na adeng yeng na just a kronge wo we are seeing na Ghana ne wunti ye here Supreme Court judges. Then tini ye wo Supreme Court judges, a country of less than thirty one million, eighteen Supreme Court judges. Ka ka one Supreme Court judge be a no liability every hundred and fifty thousand dollars, hundred and fifty thousand cities a month. Kona kubun kunta he ne V eight ordered them, ne bodyguards ne ne driver ne ne. Ne crony, but then in tea near for an extra eight Supreme Court judges. And no quant chang says, See, I mean, Moka say, Yeah, what 34 uh, uh, friend, then uh, 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 ambassadorial post around the world. 34 Vatican City, ah, a will room cry, yeah, what ambassador, what then na ambassador of Vatican City, yeah, Magana, Munkan Chang. I think the war ambassadors were baby to say more than the war friend then Sri Lanka say Sudan nominee are they then or common a year near the by in the year war ambassadors were Sudan. It doesn't make any kind of sense. So we're here in Levy. What is this? Yes, I were 58 diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission no, and Kahun Fasuna said we will trade desk. Eddy income, commerce, a bread Ghana. So diplomatic missions around the world, they are 50, 80. Sika beng wa de bread Ghana. Mon kanchire ye near here. E ye krong waste of money and resource. Muse mo refe e levy. Ye bet chida mo se e levy. No mon kona mon ko ye infi mo amu futum. Positions na mo kreti a hun ninfa sono. E hon na mon ko ye infi. A deng na mo hao Ghana for sa MPP fo. Deng na Ghana fo a ye munti. Na de biya ye nchi a se, ye nchi a se no. Sa position see now was he were over two thousand executive positions are what were executive benefits and perks what to kwang were business class one ya four by four no many are this how many nes who were yifi ho and I what also and no no be ma eleven no income from eleven ye be nyefi ho mroso 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 then necessary ye catch the a kufu adu no government say sa de no munko yi yifi ho no na mo boka Ghana foka unnecessarily. Na mu bwe wye yi ne wye. Na eskavete sa unyanku pwa do miye nse. Ye nsa unko ka. Ni ye nang na niye mfa nye sika. Niye mfa nte wye yi levi kason. Mwa be kache yi nse mwa kwa shi wye eskavete 85. Eskavete sa bako ye over 150,000 to 200,000. Mwa sa kwa shi wye naka hon. Na pa no no wye hi ye zi. Kop no wye hi. Ti no wye hi ya anom. Kop no so awa obo na kwa hon. Hey, Ekufuado and his government. Why? Ghana fo. Ye mpenende mpene china. Ile vino. Wana yezubashan wana anu wa. Kwa yifu isi kanu wa zaba. Ye mpen. 
ene le wo pene eh ye no mo ba ba ku ye be jina mu de ne ne se ye rempene akufu ado and his government aden aden o se when uh, cluelessness meets unpreparedness no mpp infoni na be hu ho ya bram we not going to take this we not having this monfa ye mpene ne mpene china eleven ye tia Munko inko cut legislature, munko cut executive, munko cut uh, judiciary, nasi can ambassadors, any uh, wa friend uh, uh, ambassadorial post, any uh, 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 diplomatic missions, sanya many na mun cancel, na mun reduce, na mun fa computers in your legislature say ye what 275 no, ye bet me the drone, drone I replace one, ye here 275. At the maximum four per region here, sixty-four parliamentarians here, two hundred and eleven parliamentarians. No, where liability to Ghana at about hundred thousand cities every month. Yen chawungi fiho. Come on, enough of this nonsense. Yerim, yerim. I want your word in Krasimbo. Okay. Okay. So when we are the Krasimbo of knowledge, strength, adaptability, <laughs> energy, freedom. Unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love, strength. Said in class symbols when you know you be a bra, bo be a baby or boy, yeah. Now the sign and no pepper no. Now you're the car and in class symbols in a home. Okay. Now Ghana for what you know see I who know say. Said the another one who could for the able to mind. You need your home. And see, this is the a in class symbol for failure. What? It's a free nerdy call. Said in class symbol. You who spells him you know yeah. I can't in class in Boso. Your president is now a free nerdy co. Who is best in the new way? I can't in class in Boso. Photo is an edding class in Boso. You are a failure. You are a failure. I beg and pay for what we are saying. Yen and Nanuma Motina see here at the class and boss. You see, for wink. This photo in class and boss. Apostle, we hear of this. I'll tell Apostle about this. This is what you want to use your life for. Oh my God. I am a boy. Why? It is a castle. Oh, man, you hear my. Hey! Then, num, a memoir and quiet, you know. Mother. I come to you. 